wise? I asked. Well, they're not cats, mind you, Bass said. But yes, wise. Khufu says that as soon as Carter keeps his promise, he'll take you to the professor. I blinked. The prof- Oh, you mean- Right. What promise? Carter asked. The corner of Bass's mouth twitched. Apparently you promised to show him your basketball skills. Carter's eyes widened with alarm. We don't have time! Oh, it's fine, Bass promised. It's best that I go now. But where, Bast? I asked. I wasn't anxious to be separated from her again. How will we find you? The look in her eyes changed to something like guilt, as if she just caused a horrible accident. I'll find you when you get out, if you get out. What do you mean, if? Carter asked, but Bast had already turned into Muffin and raced off. Khufu barked at Carter more insistently. He tugged his hand, pulling him onto the court. The baboons immediately broke into two teams. Half took off their jerseys, half left them on. Carter, sadly, was on the no-jersey team, and Khufu helped him pull his shirt off, exposing his bony chest. The teams began to play. Now, I know nothing about basketball, but I'm fairly sure one isn't supposed to trip over one's shoes, or catch a pass with one's forehead, or dribble, is that the word? with both his hands as if petted an impossibly rabid dog. But that is exactly the way Carter played. The baboon simply ran him over, quite literally. They scored basket after basket as Carter struggled back and forth, try getting hit with the ball whenever it came too close to him, tripping over more monkey limbs until he was so dizzy he turned in a circle and fell over. The baboon stopped playing and watched him in disbelief. Carter lay in the middle of the court, covered in sweat and panting. The other baboons looked at Khufu. It was quite obvious they were all thinking, Who invited this human? Khufu covered his eyes in shame. Carter! I said in glee. All that talk about basketball and the Lakers, and your absolute rubbish, beaten by monkeys! He groaned miserably. It was... it was Dad's favorite game. I stared at him. Dad's favorite game? God, why hadn't that occurred to me? Apparently, he took my godsmacked expression as further criticism. I I can tell you any NBA stat you want, he said a bit desperately. Rebounds, assists, free throw percentages. The other baboons went back to their game, ignoring Carter and Kofu both. Kofu let out a disgusted noise, half gag, half bark. I understood the sentiment, but I came forward and offered Carter my hand. Come on, then. It doesn't matter. If I had better shoes, he suggested, or if I wasn't so tired. Carter, I said with a smirk, it doesn't matter, and I'll not breathe a word of it to Dad when we save him. He looked at me with obvious gratitude. Well, I am rather wonderful, after all. Then he took my hand and, hoist, and I hoisted him up. Now, for God's sake, put on your shirt, I said, and Khufu, it's time you took us to the professor. Khufu led us into a deserted science building. The air in the hallways smelled of vinegar, and the empty classroom labs looked like something from a, an American high school. Not the sort of place a god would hang out. We climbed the stairs and found a row of professor's offices. Most of the doors were closed. One had been left open, revealing a space no bigger than a broom closet stuffed with books, a tiny desk, and one chair. I wondered if that professor had done something bad to get such a small office. Oh! Kofu stopped in front of a polished mahogany door, much nicer than the others. A newly stenciled name glistened on the glass, Dr. Toth. Without knocking, Kofu opened up the door and waddled inside. After you, chicken man, I told Carter. And yes, I'm sure he was regretting telling me about the, that particular incident. After all, I couldn't completely stop teasing him. I have a reputation to maintain. I expected another broom closet. Instead, the office was impossibly big. The ceiling rose at least ten meters with one side of the office all windows looking out over the Memphis skyline. Metal stairs led up to a loft dominated by an enormous telescope, and from somewhere up there came the sound of an electric guitar being strummed quite badly. The other walls of the office were crammed with bookshelves. Work tables overflowed with weird bits and bobs, chemistry sets, half-assembled computers, stuffed animals with electri electrical wires sticking out of their heads. The room smelled strongly of cooked beef, 
but with a smokier, tangier scent than I'd ever smelled.